All right. I think we should be live. At least I hope we are. It's a lot of setup again for today, but I think everything should be good to go. Um, I hope people are here. Um, I hope at least someone's here. So if you can hear me, please um, throw a message in chat. Then uh, I know that I am audible. So let me check. Everything okay? Stream health seems to be good although i'm getting the audio bitrate errors again or it's not so much an error like youtube says it's a suggestion but it doesn't seem to be a suggestion so if you can hear me then hello 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 very good very good my moderator says that she can hear me so that's perfectly fine so i am audible right very good very good so and let's see me as well. See us loud and clear, Danny. Thank you, thank you. So, cheers. Um, we still have like two to three minutes before we start, so we can just wait a little bit until all of the students arrive and everyone's here. Ah, oh, man, what a busy day. What a busy day. But I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you guys, so... Very good. I'm visible as well. Uh, that's perfect. So yeah, yeah. How do you like? How do you guys like the drawing? I spent a lot of time coming up with something that would represent data. So in the end, I figured that it would be a truck carrying data. Um, all right, people entering the Zoom meeting, which is fine as well, since not everyone has a proper YouTube account. All right, so four people. That's not the amount of people that I am expecting for the lecture, but of course it's being recorded so people can always watch it back later. And I think the nice thing about watching it back later is that you can do it at like 200% speed, um, which means that you only spend half of the time. But I sound like a smurf. That's one of the drawbacks of <laughs> sending it in 200% speed like I never realized that before that um, because I'm like recording the lectures and putting them on YouTube people can more or less do what they want right so 200% speed is, is a possibility so anyway anyway so are we excited about data is there anything that you guys really want to learn about data because I've prepared a whole bunch of slides um, but um, I'm always open for questions and suggestions. So questions and suggestions are highly, highly appreciated. Um, because I do think that, like, I'm not a novice, right? I, I've been programming all my life since I was four years old. And it's for you guys to learn. So sometimes there's like really tiny, really obvious things that I think for granted, which you guys are struggling with. and then let me know because one of these things that is really hard for me to judge is to judge what is hard for you guys. So I hope that, that people become a little bit more vocal. Um, I sent around an email this morning to all of the students like saying that, well, I haven't had any questions. So that means that I just assumed that everyone was able to do the assignments. And then I got a couple of mails back with people that said, oh, no, I got stuck here on the assignment which is perfectly fine, but um, don't get stuck for a whole week. Get stuck for like 30 minutes and then just jump in your email and shoot me a question. Um, I generally answer back very, very quickly. Um, so, and don't feel like you're bothering me or something like that. That's not the case. Um, I'm here for you guys to help you. Um, so that's the reason why we're doing this. And in the end, it's for you guys to learn how to program. So. It's better to ask questions now um, than to just not ask questions. All right, so it's two, at least on my clock. So eight out of 37 students. That's one of the reasons why I want to do it in person, because then it means that I can just check attendance and see who's there. Um, so it's one of these advantages of doing it in person. All right, let's do the first slide, right? So assignments from last week. Um, let me know what you thought about the assignments. Were they too many? Were there too few? Were they too hard? Were they too easy? Right? Because for me, they're all really easy. Because like I said, been programming for a long time, so I can 
I have a hard time judging what you guys find difficult. But um, let's just look at my answers for lecture number two. Um, and for this, I actually wanted to ask you guys a question. How do you guys want to do it? Because last time I just showed you my answers and we went through them one by one, but we can do it the other way around as well. I can just do them live. So I can just close my answers and then just go through the questions one by one. Um, a little too many for my taste. Okay, so that, that's good feedback. And I know that there are too many in lecture number two, um, but it's, it's okay, I think, because you don't have to do them all. Like the most important ones are on the top and then the other ones are more to kind of have you guys apply what you learned. Um, but um, I, I can drop some and move some to lecture number three. Um, let me actually look at the lectures for uh, today because today we also uh, have a bunch of uh, lectures. So uh, a bunch of assignments. Um, although I think they're a little bit less than lecture number two. Good, so uh, I would love to do them live, but I understand if it's lame for everyone else. Well, I, I don't know, like um, we can do them live. Okay, um, so on Zoom, we got a question, if it is possible, I would ask to spend more time in the assignments four, seven and eight, actually more four and eight. The seventh uh, actually could solve it, but I tried to flip the coin for n times and I could not have the loop really going on. All right, so I think that it would be good that I just get an empty notepad and then um, we just do them one by one, right? Because we have some time and I think I only have like 40-ish slides for the lecture today. Um, and the lecture today is going to be really about programming. Like the first two lectures, there's a lot of theory in there. Um, and I know that, but I do the theory first or up front so that when we need it then you guys already know and I don't have to spend the whole time then explaining the theory. Good so let's switch to notepad right so um, assignments so first things first we're just gonna say give me a header and I'm gonna save it so that I get answers live 3 dot r right so if I give them the r extension then code highlighting kicks in um, so I can say answers to assignment three and then it is copyrighted by Danny Ahrens well which is not really true because it's actually the how Berlin since they are paying me for it so generally I have first have a set working directory but I don't think that we need it yet um, because generally the first assignments uh, the first two lectures they don't use any data, right? We're just generating random numbers and writing some for loops and while loops. So it should be fine to do without um, setting your working directory. But I'm going to put it in just because um, we can and I'm going to comment it out. Um, so it's there in case we need it. All right, so let me get the assignments then. So first assignments were about control structures, right? So the first question, 1a is generate a random number between zero and one using the runif function and store this, uh, val uh, store this value in a variable with the name unknown. All right, so we need to define a variable called unknown. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to use the runif function. We're going to generate one random number between zero and one. Right, so it's it's how many I want, minimum value, maximum value, and of course, if we are in R, we can also check um, we can also check the function. Right, so if you don't know exactly how the runif function work, um, just do question mark runif and uh, look at the help file because the help file will give you an example and it will explain which parameters are there. So variable unknown between zero and one. So question one a solved. So let me add um, hashtag one a. Um, so and then that's it. Um, of course we can do it in another way as well. So we can just type run if one, which will do the same thing because actually the default values are to generate a number, and then we can store it in unknown like this, right? So we can use the forward arrow to assign to the right side. We can use the backward arrow to assign to the left side. All right, so next question, question 1b. 
Alright, use an if statement and then use the cut or print function to print out either lower or higher if the variable is smaller than 0.5 or bigger than 0.5. Alright, so let's do that. So I'm just gonna say, well, if unknown, right, because that's what I want to check, um, smaller than 0.5, what do I want to do? I want to cut, so I want to write something to the screen and I'm going to say is lower than 0.5 slash new line because I'm using the cut function I have to include the new line character otherwise R just continues on the same line um, and I generally like knowing what the value was right so I'm just going to say paste um, and then paste the unknown value that we have and then combine that with is lower than 0.5 right so I'm going to check my brackets using the highlighting so it seems that this is closing the paste this is closing the um, cut and then of course in the if statement I want to use curly brackets to denote where it starts and ends and then I want to do an else branch um, and then I want to print the other way around so um, um, higher than 0.5 close the bracket Right, so um, let's save it. Um, let's quickly go to R and make sure that everything works right. So I'm going to go to R and I'm just going to copy paste my whole code in. And then indeed it says 0.81 is higher than 0.5, which is true. So it seems to work, but of course I need to test both branches, right? Because testing one branch is not going to be enough because I don't know for sure that the lower than statement works. Um, so I'm just going to run the same code a couple of times to see, yeah, so we're already there. So the lower branch also works um, because 0.17 is indeed lower. All right, so 1c, generate a uniform value between minus 10 and 30. Round this to zero digits behind the comma and using an if statement, check if the value you generated is between zero and 10 inclusively. If the value is not in this range, throw a stop error. All right, so let's go back to notepad. So again, we want to use the uniform function. So I'm going to say hashtag 1c. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to still use the unknown variable because why not? We already have it defined. So I'm going to say run if one number between minus 10 and 30. And I want to round it. So I'm just going to use the round function. I'm going to say comma zero. So no digits behind the comma. Right, so just go to R, check if it works, right, because we, we do want to make sure that it works. So now the value of a known is 28, and now the value of a known is minus 5. So it seems to work, right, it seems to be within the range that I want to. All right, so now we have to check if it is between 0 and 10. Um, so let's go back to Notepad and start coding. So I'm now going to say if, and then unknown is between 0 and 10. So is it larger than or um, larger than or equal to um, ah, my keyboard layout switched again to the stupid German layout, English layout. All right, unknown larger or equal to 10 and and because it needs to be both of them need to be true at the same time and unknown is smaller than or equal to 10. Um, I want to do something, so I want to... All right, so only if it's not the case do I want to throw a stop error. So I could just do nothing, but I'm just going to say um, cut um, between uh, 0 and 10. And don't forget the new line. And else I need to throw a stop error, so I'm just going to say stop uh, unknown is not in the range we want it to be slash new line and I'm going to paste right because I still want to know what value I drew so I'm going to say unknown and then I'm going to say unknown right so I'm just going to print the number um, and then of course we need to test it a couple of times to make sure that we hit both the if branch as well as the else branch to make sure that both of these work. All right, so let's go to R and in R we're just going to generate it. So error unknown 23 is not in the range that we want it to be, which is true. 15 is also not, minus one is also not. So we're getting relatively unlucky with the numbers that we draw. 
and in this case we see between 0 and 10. Um, I forgot to actually print back the number itself um, so let's see what we actually drew. So we drew a 1. So seems to work right? 0 and 10. Alright next question hashtag 2a. Question 2a. Use a for loop and sum up all the numbers from 1 to 1000 inclusively. You can check if your answer is correct by comparing the result to the result of sum 1 to 1000. Right? So that's kind of what we want. So let's go back to notepad. So I'm going to say I have a for sum. Right? So this will be my total. This will store the, the result of all of the summation. Initially I haven't added up any numbers. So that means that the number will be 0. And then I'm going to say 4x in 1, oh, um, that's a bracket too much, 4x in 1, 2, 1000. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to say for sum is for sum plus x. And then after we're done, we're going to check for sum itself. And then we're also going to check sum of 1 to 1000, right? Because these two should be equal. So very basically, I'm defining the variable which will store the total, so the answer, and then I'm just going to loop a thousand times. Every time x will get the value in this range, so first one, then two, then three, and I'm just going to add it, and then I'm going to print it to the screen. So let's go to R, see if this works. Um, so seems to work. So if I add up all of the numbers from 1 to 1000, the answer is going to be uh, 500,500. And indeed, that matches the, the, the result that we had or the, the expected result. All right, next one, 2b. Um, I think 2b is doing the same, but now with a while loop. So I think that this is one of the hardest questions because while loops are difficult to reason about because you have to keep track of how many times we're iterating, right? And if you write the, uh, the, the thing that you're checking wrong, your while statement will continue on forever and ever. So I'm just going to define a variable called while sum, right? Same as the for sum, but this is going to be the result from the while loop. Um, and I need to have my number. So I need to, because I need to keep track of how many times I go through the loop, I need to define this myself. So I'm just going to say this is x, right? So x initially is 1. So I can say while x is smaller than or equal to 1000, what do I want to do? Well, I want to do the same as what I did before. So I'm wanting to do while sum is while sum plus x. And now I have to remember to increase x, right? Because we now added x, so we want to do it one thing for me. I think that happened to be because my R console froze. Yeah, that's one of the biggest issues. If you write your while loop wrong, it will continue indefinitely. If I would not, if I would do nothing and I would just run it like this, right? So I would just run this code, then this would run forever and ever and ever, right? Because X will always be one and nothing will change. And since one is always smaller than or equal to a thousand, it will just continue forever. And then you have to quit it yourself. Um, but let's not do that. So let's just say x equals x plus 1, right? Um, and let's use the proper equal sign because we already defined x. All right. And then, of course, we want to check while sum. And now we know that it needs to be 500,500. So I'm not going to add the additional sum like we did before. So let's just see what's going to happen um, if it will run, if it will stop. Um, go to R. All right, and then let's see what happens. And indeed, the while sum also ends up with 500,500. And of course, you have the little stop button, right? So if you, if you by chance, happen to write the while loop wrong, and it will take more than like 30 seconds, um, just click the stop button to, to stop the current computation. Um, so that's, that's why, what it's there for. All right, so there was question two. Question three, create a for loop that does the following a hundred times. All right, and then there's three steps. Generate a random number, use if, else, if, else to check if the variable is lower, higher, or equal than 42. Use cut to print one of the three statements, replace x by the random number, make sure you add a new line. All right, and then it says x is lower than 42, x is higher than 42, or 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, so 
of course that's a reference to the hitchhiker's guide of the galaxy so let's just do that right so um, I want to do something so question three so I want to do something a hundred times so I'm just going to say four um, x in one to a hundred right so everything within the brackets will be done a hundred times I'm not going to use x right because x is just a variable that I'm defining here but I need to define a variable um, to to have the for loop work right because I can't define for one in a hundred I have to say x in one in a hundred so what are we going to do we're going to generate a random number so I'm going to do run if I want to have one number from zero to a hundred and I want to round it down of course be with zero digits behind the comma and I'm going to store this in a variable called life or whatever you can you can choose your variable names but in this case since it's a hitchhiker's guide of the galaxy ref our hitchhiker's guide of the galaxy reference uh, we just call it life like why not okay so then I want to say if life is smaller than 42 um, then what do I want to do I want to say cut paste right because I want to print back the number so I want to paste life comma is smaller than 42 slash new line um, slash new line right because go to the next line else if life is larger than 42 I can say cut paste life is larger than 42 and else right so and now I can use this because I, I checked exclusively right so if a number is not lower than 42 and a number is not higher than 42 it has to be equal to 42 so I don't have to do an else if um, life is is 42 because I know this implicitly right because the first statement checks if it's lower the second one checks if it's higher so if it's none of those it needs to be the same um, that's basic numerology um, so let's just um, print the statement and then in this case we can just say is the answer to life the universe and everything and of course I'm not going to use 42 I'm just going to use um, the variable itself all right so this is more or less how it looks like right so it's just a big for loop we don't use the variable that we define in the for loop we just use it to go and do something a hundred times and drawing a random number checking it checking it again and then of course if it's not higher if it's not lower then it has to be the same all right so let's see if we made no errors or any um, brackets or something like that so let's go to R and just see what happens when we run this a couple of times all right so let's start at the beginning we drew the number 28 which is smaller we draw the number 92 which is larger so we checked the if and the else if and then we're lucky because we drew 42 one time out of 100 which is pretty unlucky generally you draw it like once or twice but at least we drew it once right so um, 42 good back to notepad question number four I think four was the one that someone wanted to have more time with okay so Question number four, one of my favorites, because I like triangles. Um, don't know why, it's one of my favorite shapes. So if you like triangles, um, let me know, because I think um, a lot of people like triangles. Triangles are like a good shape. Um, don't know why, but in computers, like everything that is being rendered on a computer generally is rendered in kind of triangles. Um, so it's good to, to know about triangles and like triangles. Um, some people like hexagons I don't know why people would like hexagons it's a silly shape but um, I think it's because of CPG gray who did a whole hexagons are the best icons I think triangles are the best best angles <laughs> whatever you want to call it all right so making the triangle so use a while or a for loop and the cut function to print out a triangle of hashtags having 12 lines each line should have one more hashtag than the previous line right so we start off with line number one having one hashtag line number two having two hashtags line number three having three hashtags right so the first thing that we have to realize is that the number of hashtags that we're printing is the same as the line that we're on 
circles. So yeah, circles are perfect as well because they are literally perfect, right? They don't have any angles, um, but they are infinite shapes. Hexagons are cool because of bees. <sighs> yeah, yeah, bees are cool. Hexagons are, I don't know, I don't know. They're, they're good, right? Because it's like a shape to, um, so it's like the circumference to the content of the thing. And circles, of course, are the best because it's the least amount of area surrounding it and the most inside. Um, but hexagons are relatively stable. But video cards, they work with triangles. So you can only draw a triangle on your video card and that's it. So I like triangles a lot. But back to the question, right? So the, we have to realize, the first thing that you have to realize, if I'm on line number eight, I need to draw eight of these hashtags, right? So, and we need to do something an X amount of time, in this case, 12, right? Because we want to have 12 lines. So the easiest would be because we know how far we need to go, we just use a for loop, right? So I'm going to say four, and then the line that I'm currently on in one to 12. Right? And now I need to have as many hashtags as the line that I'm on. Or I can also say, let's do it line.n, right? So for line number. So the, we learned a function which can repeat something an x amount of time, right? Which is the rep function. So we can do rep. And what do we want to repeat? Well, we want to repeat the hashtag symbol. How often do we want to repeat the hashtag symbol? Well, we want to repeat it line.n times, right? Because if I'm on line one, I want to have one hashtag. If I'm on line seven, I want to have seven. So, and these are then called hashes or whatever you want to call them. And now the only thing that I have to do is print them to the screen, right? And then put a new line behind them. So I'm just going to say cut and I'm going to say paste. And what do I want to paste together? Well, I want to paste the hashes together. And then I'm going to add a new line at the end. Right, so let's run this and see what happens. So let's go to R and then we're just going to copy the code and I'm going to go to R and just copy the code in. Right, so you see now that something annoying happens, right? Because the annoying thing that happens here is, is that we see that there are spaces in between. And in the in the example, there were no spaces, but it already looks like a triangle. So let's remove the spaces, right? So the spaces are because I'm using the paste function, right? So the paste function has a parameter which is called the separator. And the default separator is a space. So I just want to say, well, overwrite the default separator and say that my separator is nothing, right? So don't put a space, put nothing in between. So now if I would go to R and paste this in, it would, it should, it should fix the spaces, which it doesn't. So that's strange. So where do the spaces come from? So the spaces come from the fact that the paste function is a very complex function. So it can paste two things together, but if you give it a vector, like we saw in one of the first assignments where we gave the row names, right? So we did paste um, individual comma one to 10. Right? And then you see that it actually makes 10 individuals. And this is a vector. So if I have a vector and I try to paste a vector onto itself, then that is actually not called separating them, but that is called collapsing them. So what you have to figure out, right? In this case, you just have to read the help file of the paste function. Um, let me see if I can get that one in the correct window probably can so when we go to firefox right it it the, the the function description says concatenate vectors after converting to character right and then you see it as a separator this is a character string to separate the terms and then you have collapse an optional character string to separate the results so you have individual terms that you paste together those are separated by the separator but if you have a vector, then the vector is collapsed together using the collapse parameter. So in this case, we also need to set the collapse parameter to being true, to, to, to having, a, having, a, having a value, right? So in this case, we have to go back, right? We have to go to the hashes and say hashes is the repeat, cut, paste, separator is this, collapsing is also this, 
right? So if you get a vector, collapse the vector on itself, make a single string out of it, and if you do that, collapse them using um, nothing, right? So to get rid of all of the spaces. All right, so let's see how this works in R. So go to R and print it out. So now it works, right? So now we have no spaces, we have a triangle, and it's a length of 12. Good, so I hope this, uh, this, this was not too hard. And the, the idea behind not giving you a hint about this is that you guys should be learning to read the documentation, right? If something doesn't work as you expect it, read the documentation. There's actually in, I think in this case, for the collapse, um, there's probably an example, right? So here you see paste zero nth collapse. And so to collapse the output into a single string, pass the collapse argument, right? So you could just run all of the examples and then you could figure out that, oh yeah, no, they have an example for when you want to paste a vector together, right? So just run the examples and then in the example, it shows you that indeed, yes, you can use this additional hidden parameter um, to collapse things to, to get rid of additional spaces in there. Good. So read the documentation because I can't tell you everything, right? In the end, programming is discovery, right? You have to figure out where you want to go and then you go there and along the way you have to solve all kinds of little problems and these little problems you can solve by either going online and asking a question or you can solve them um, just by looking at the documentation 99% of the time. Good, next question. Next question is question number five already. So number five is uh, string escaping. Um, so um, this is a little bit nonsensical to kind of do, um, but let me just do it for you guys, right? Because it's often the case that you want to print stuff to a file and then you have to use like the double quote or you have to use a single quote or a backslash or something else, right? So we're just going to do them. So this is question number five. So let's do question number five and let me guys show you notepad so that you can kind of keep track of what I'm doing. Um, so I'm just going to copy paste the text directly um, just to make sure. So I'm just going to say cut and I'm going to put what I want to cut and I'm just going to make sure that I do it on the line, right? And now you can see that Notepad++ is really helpful, right? It already shows me that, okay, so this in gray is within the string, right? Because everything inside of a, a string variable or a, a character variable is colored gray. And here, this is black, meaning that this is outside of the string. Why? Because here I have this, this character, which is not escaped, right? So I have to escape this one. So let's just put a slash in front of it. All right, so then we go. Escaping stuff is great, but I think slash and hmm. So slash always needs to be escaped. The backslash itself needs to have be escaped. So put another backslash in front. Forward slash don't, doesn't need escaping. And then might be a nuisance, right? So the sentence doesn't end here because this is part of what we want to cut. And then we continue. You are correct, but I think that slash t, right? So I have to put an extra slash in front of the slash to escape it. Slash b, extra slash to escape it. Uh, create more of a problem than a basic hashtag. And actually this is a smart quote, so just replace it by a slash quote. All right, so this should be then it, right? And then we can close the string here. So let's see, go to r, see if it works. So let's go to r, see if it works. And then um, let's compare it. I say double point escaping. So that's good, it's great, but slash, that's also fine. Nuisance, then there's a new line, which is what we wanted. Um, you are correct, but I think the slash T and slash B create more of a problem than a basic thing. Perfect, looks exactly like we had in the example text. All right, so one of the things that I kind of sneakily did, right, is I didn't add in my own new lines. And this is one of these little things that you can do in R, is that if you, oh, let me switch you guys to Notepad, right, if you, if you do like this, right, so the, the slash here, right, this slash is closed here. But I'm giving an enter inside of the string. And because I'm using cut, it recognizes that this is a multi-line multi string, sorry. 
And because it's a multi-line string, it will automatically include the new line for me. Um, so a little bit of a trick, um, but you don't really have to worry about that. Often you just want to type the new line yourself just to be sure. All right, question number six. Question number six. All right, 6a. Random variables. Set your random number generator seed to a value of your choice. All right, that's easy, right? So we can just say set dot seed. The value of my choice is 42. You can pick any number that you want. I always pick 42. That's my seed and I'm sticking with it. Use runif to generate a vector containing 15 random numbers between 0 and 10 and store it in a variable called random1. All right. Let's do this. Random one is run if, right? Yep, to generate 15 random numbers between 0 and 10. So 15 random numbers between 0 and 10. And that's question 1, 6b already. So 6a, question 6b. All right. Right, so let's just make sure that this works. So we go to notepad, right? We uh, generate, we type random one. And then we set our seed back and then we generate random one again and then we type it again and then it should be exactly the same. So yes, every number in the first time matches the second time. So we have repeatable randomness. All right, so next question. Use the round function to round your random numbers in random one. Right, so let's go to here and round them down. So let's say uh, let's just do it like this, 6b and c, and I'm just going to put the round function around it saying no digits behind the comma. Right, so let's rerun the code in R, see if we didn't break anything. Um, so of course we now expect random one to start with 9, and then the next one would be 9 as well, and oh, um, random one, so 9, 9, 3, and these kinds of what does set C do? I don't get it. Okay, so if I do run if, right, I generate a random number. So if I generate a random number, oh, um, run if, just generate one. So I generate 0 0.94. Then I generate 0 0.97, 0 0.11. So if I want to have a repeatable randomness, right, because often I want to be able to repeat my analysis and get the exact same result. So if I'm using random numbers somewhere in the analysis, then at some point I have to fix my random number generator, right? So the set seed is what does that for me, right? So if I do a set dot seed of the number 42, and then afterwards I generate a random number, and I'm going to do this on one line so we can repeat it a couple of times, then it will always generate the exact same number, no matter how often I do it because I fix my seed. So the first number that I draw or the numbers that I draw after setting my seed will always be the same. So if I generate like five numbers, they will always be the same. Funnily enough, the first number will still be the same as before, right? And setting my seed again will generate the exact five numbers. So in case that I want to write a test case, um, for an algorithm that I've designed, and this algorithm uses random numbers, I need to know what is the output, because otherwise I can't test it, right? If the output is more or less dependent on the random numbers that I input or that I use, then I need to weigh to generate repeatable randomness. And that is what set C does, repeatable randomness. All right, so let's go back to Notepad. So we have our random one vector, which rounds it. And now reset your C to your number and generate a single random number using our norm. All right, so we're going to do 6D. All right, so hashtag 6D. So the number used for set seed can be literally any one number. Or how does the choice of number influence the randomness is repeated? It doesn't, it just gives you multiple starting points. So setting your C to 42 will lead to a, a lead to random numbers being this. Setting your C to 500 will generate a different vector of random numbers from then on. But you have to have multiple because otherwise it would be always random, right? So in this case, um, your number is up to your choice. Um, 60. 
repeat your uh, seed, uh, reset your seed to your number and generate a single random number using our norm. Okay, so we're going to set the seed to 42 and now we're going to say our norm and we're going to generate one random number. Now repeat steps 0b and 0c, uh, that's, that's 6b and 6c, store the results in a variable random2. Alright, so I'm just going to do 6b and 6c, I'm just going to copy paste and I'm just going to store this in random2. Right, and now the question is, why is the content of random1 and random2 not equal to each other and what do you observe when looking at the sequence of numbers generated? All right. So this is a little bit tricky and it's a hard question because it's a question that requires some understanding of why we do this and, and what's happening, right? So let's, let's, let's first look at random one, right? So random one is the number that we expect them to be 9938657177, right? Because that's the first. And now we have random two, oh, random two. And random two is actually three eight six five seven one seven seven. So it is different, but it's not that different, right? Because it's just shifted, right? It's it's this part here is exactly the same as this part here. So what happened is is that when we called the R norm function, it took two random numbers from the random number generator. So then when I do the same thing as that I did before, it did not generate the 9, 9, but it did generate the other numbers and then continued because I asked for 10 numbers, right? So what is happening internally is that all of these random functions like runif, um, rnorm, um, rpoisson, all of these random number generators in R, they share the same source of randomness, right? So they share the same seed. Which means that if I if I draw a random number using the R norm function, then I influence the random numbers being drawn after with the uniform function. And of course you can imagine that, that drawing a uniform number, it takes only one, um, one, one bit of entropy. But generating a normal number takes two bits of entropy because you have a random mean and a random standard deviation. Right? While for a uniform number, you just randomly are within a, a range. So that's the idea here, is that you can have repeatable randomness, but this repeatable randomness is only guaranteed to be exactly the same as long as you don't draw any other... If, hey, if you change your code and you add an, another draw of a random number before the random numbers that you, that you want to be repeatable, then this influences it and it just shifts. And the shift in this case is always going to be two. Um, and why is it two? That's because generating a random uniform number takes one degree of freedom, while taking a random normally distributed number takes two degrees of freedom from the kind of random number generator, the source. So a little bit difficult also for the interpretation, but I think it's good to realize that you can have repeatable randomness so if you ever write an algorithm for example a machine learning algorithm which uses kind of random numbers or other things and then you can still write a test case saying that if this is the input this is my seed then this should be the output because the random numbers are randomly generated but they are repeatable random Good, so that's seven, uh, that's six F. Let's go back to Noteplat. So six F is more or less an interpretation question. So I'm not going to add that. All right, so functions. Okay, so good. We've done more or less the practicing with the if statements, the for loops, the while loops, and now we're at the favorite part, which is creating functions. So question number seven, I think this is one of the questions that, um, Yep, so we're going to spend a little bit more time on this. Okay, so create a function that returns the result of a coin flip. So a coin can only land on its head or on its tail. Um, so we're just going to have a function which is called flip coin, right? So we're going to say hashtag seven um, flip coin. Um, flip coin is a function and it takes no input parameters. And then I'm just going to say um, our runif one number 
between 0 and 1, and I'm going to round them down, uh, one digit behind the comma. Yeah, I can do it better, right? Be ah, no, let's let's keep with the run if thing, right? So I'm just going to round the number down. Let's check in R if this really generates what we want. Uh, no, I'm zero digits behind the comma. Oh, sorry, zero digits. Right, so this seems to more or less do what we want. Sometimes it generates zero, sometimes it generates one. So in R, because arrays start from 1, I'd rather have a number which is 1 or 2, right? So because then I can just create an array and select the first or the second one. So let's do this and let's say instead of generating a number for 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1, let's generate an, a random number from 1 to 2 and then round it down. So this will give me 1 or this will give me 2. All right, so let's copy this in, in the function. So I'm going to say, this is my index, right? So the index, and then I'm going to say, well, I have two options. I either have heads or I have tails. And now use the index that I just drew to, to take one of these two out. And then return this to the user, right? And then this is going to be my function. Right, so I'm going to draw a number which is going to be either 1 or 2. Then I'm going to make a little vector containing two elements. And then I'm going to say from this little vector take either the first or the second one. Which one we're going to take is based on the variable called index. And index will either contain 1 or 2. Alright, so let's flip the coin a uh, couple of times, right? So we're going to paste in the function. And now when we want to call the function, we need to do flip coin and then uh, round brackets. So flip coin, flip coin, flip coin. So yeah, it either generates heads or it generates tails. Can we actually prove that it's actually reliable, right? Because a coin will half of the time fall on tails, half of the time will fall on heads. So of course we want to check that kind of a little bit, right? So just to make sure. So I'm just going to say for x in one, two, Let's draw it 10,000 times or 100,000, 10,000 times. So we're just going to say flip coin. Um, and then I'm going to say I have a vector, which is my uh, flips, which initially is empty. So to my vector called flips, add flip coin. Right, so just very basic. And you will see this all over again in R, right? So all over in R, you see defining a new variable, initially being empty, having a for loop, and then using the C function where you have the empty array at the beginning or everything that we did so far. And then we add just a single new value to it and it's being assigned back to what we had. Um, pretty memory inefficient, but it works really well. All right, so let's flip the coin 10,000 times and then make sure that um, it works, right? So now we have our flips, right? So those are my flips that I had. And now what I can do is I can just make a table out of this um, to make sure that it's around 50-50, which, which is true, right? There's going to be some variation because there are randoms, random numbers in there. Um, so in this case, 5,006 uh, 5, heads, 4,494 tails. So pretty random, pretty balanced in a way, right? Only six times did it fall more to heads than to tails, but that's something that we might expect. All right, so that's our function and directly we have a little test for it. Um, so let's go to question number eight, hashtag eight. All right, question number eight. Reuse the code you created in assignment four, but now make a function. Uh, we have a question on the Zoom. Uh, a question, what if we need like seven flips or n flips, n put in by the user? Um, okay, so sure. Then of course the function needs to have a parameter, right, n. And then I'm just going to do this, right? Because I already made my test, which does the coin flip a couple of times. Um, so then I'm just going to say, take this part out, right? And then say one flip. And 
and now I'm going to create a new variable called multiflip, right, which initially is empty, and I'm just going to say for x in 1, 2, n. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to create an index, we're going to flip the coin once, and now we're going to remember. So we're going to say multiflip is a combination of multiflip that we had and one flip that we just did. And then, of course, we're now going to return multiflip. So kind of a mixture between the testing of the function, right? And so just write a for loop around it. If you want to do something n times, just make a for loop which does something n times. And of course, you then have to create a vector. So you have to make sure um, that you store the result. So again, same strategy. Initially, create a variable which is empty. Do what you want to do and then just add it to the empty variable, the one thing that you want to remember, and then store it back into the, to the thing that remembers everything. So now, of course, our flip coin function will look a little bit different. Um, so let's delete the test because we now need a new test, right? So we now need a test called flip coin once, flip coin 10, and then we say flip coin 50 um, just to test. So let's copy paste this into R. So when we go to R, um, then we would have one flip, 10 flips, and 50 flips. Right, so again, the same thing. If you need more stuff, just put a for loop around it. For is your friend, especially if you know how often you want to do something. With a while loop, it's harder because then you have to figure out when you need to stop. Um, but for something like this, it's not, not too hard. And you can, of course, you could have made a new function out of this as well, right? Instead of um, what I did and butcher my original function, um, I could have just created a function called flip coin. And then I could have made a function called flip multi coin or multi flip. Would you please upload both the solution of the original question eight as well as the special solution? Sure. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I, did I not already upload them? I think if you look on Moodle, then the original solution, it might be a little bit different because you can do this like 10 tens of times. Um, let me actually check Moodle for you guys. I think I already uploaded the assignments uh, or the answers to the assignments. Um, so that should be already there. And of course I can do the multi flip as well. Um, Moodle just to check that it's there. Um, yeah, so answers to more introductions should be there. Um, flip coin, flip coin. Oh, I, I called it. Yeah, so I did it completely different in the original answers. So in the original answers, I did this. Um, so this is what I had in, um, in the answers online. Right, so here I just drew my random number and then I checked if it's smaller or if it's larger. And then I actually had a special case for when it's on its side, um, <laughs> which might be uh, interesting because of course a coin can fall on its side as well. So probably as a joke, I, I just made it so that it can be heads, it can be tails um, or it can be on its side. Um, but yeah, I will, I will update both of them and, and add some to it. Yeah, but in this case, you can be really creative. Um, there's actually a special function for what we're doing here, right? Because we're generating an index and then using that. We don't have to do that. In R, there's a function called sample. So I can just say sample from heads or tails one element. And this will do the exact same thing as the whole function that we just wrote, right? So it generates the index and then takes one of the two out. Um, but the sample function is just a little bit easier um, because it's just a single line uh, where you can sample. And the nice thing is, is now you can also sample 10, right? But then you have to say replace is true because of course, when you have only two elements, you can't take 10 of them out. But if you say that replacement is true, then you can actually have it multi-flip in one, one line of code. But of course here, the idea is, is that you guys work with the things that you have learned. Um, so it's, uh, 
you don't need an else for on its side. New, no, because again, like in the question number 42, um, because in the function, um, let me go back to notepad. I, yeah, let me go back to notepad. Right, so um, the original answer, let me just copy it from Moodle again, like this. Because of the return here, it builds on the function. So if it is smaller than 0 0.5, it will directly return heads and stop the function. If it is not this, then it will check this. And if this is true, then it will directly return. So it will not even try to execute this line. But of course, if this one is not true and this one is not true, then the number we drew was exactly 0 0.5. And then only then will it come to here. So in this case, because we are returning, right? Returning means throw the box out of the factory and the whole factory kind of shuts down directly. So there's, it, it doesn't even look at this line of code. So if R&D is smaller than 0 0.5, then these two lines of code are completely ignored because of the return. So the return is, is a very powerful control structure because it kind of bails on the current function. You, you give back the box and everything shuts down and is cleaned up. So there's no reason to, uh, um, to, to clean that up. You don't need an else. No, we don't need an else. And that, that's also why we don't need any brackets, because we directly return. So and it, you could do something like this, um, but that's not necessary. All right, enough flipping coins. Um, we've seen four different ways of doing it now, and there's many different ways. This is not the only two ways that you can flip a coin. That uh, that, that's, that there's more. <laughs> so you, there's even more ways of doing this. Um, but the, the sample is very elegant, right? Um, so sampling is really useful also when you want to take like a subset of individuals and the replace function also makes it really nice so that you can do it in one line of, one line of code. Good. Um, Ah, question number eight. So reuse the code you created in assignment four, but now make it a function called triangle um, that prints a triangle of which size of which the size can be specified by the user. Oh my God, that's such a like crooked sentence. Like why did nobody mail me that? Like mail me, like your assignment is just written like someone who just learned English for the first time. And there's like a prince and tri <laughs> there's even a double N. So yeah, guys, please, if you do the assignments, spell check me because like you're helping not just yourself, but also the people afterwards. So um, let me directly fix that since I have the original ones here. That prints a triangle of which the size can be specified by the user. This is like obtuse language plus plus uh, the function signature will look something like here size is the parameter that lets the user specify the number of rows in the triangle all right so bearing the very very poor spelling of the <laughs> of the question um, this is the example code that you got right so this was the code which was in the in the assignment so we want to reuse the triangle code Right, so the first thing about code reusing is that it's copy paste. So we're just going to go to the triangle, right? And we're just going to copy paste it. So we're just going to go C. We're going to go into the function and we're just going to do blam. There's our code, right? So the code for the triangle was make a for loop. We have to realize that the number of triangles that we need to print every line are the same as the line that we're on. Right, so I now have my function called triangle. I copy pasted my code in. I know that this code works for a triangle of size 12. So of course, the first thing that I'm going to do is just say, well, instead of going to 12, go to the size that the user specified. Just say size. All right, so let's try this, right? So let's just be naive and say, make a triangle of size five and then make a triangle of size 15 and then make a triangle of size um, 20 or uh, 29. That's, that's perfectly fine. All right, so let's go to R. So uh, code reuse is, uh, is the best reuse because we just copy paste it. So we go to R 
And then we see, so first triangle, one, two, three, four, five. And then this is definitely going to be 15, and this is definitely going to be 29. So looks pretty good, looks pretty good. So minimal code change, right? The only thing that we changed is the end of the for loop, um, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, and of course, this function has still some things that we might want to fix, right? because size is like no one tells you that the size can't be negative right negative 12 do we want to start off with 12 and then go all the way down um, so that's kind of the idea it's like half of a pine yeah 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 there um, there's actually originally there was actually a, another question which came back in like lecture number four five or six where you had to reuse the triangle code again so the function that you made to make a diamond so to to make four of these triangles flip them and then make them into a diamond shape um, which is also possible and and also here if the size is minus 12 should we start off very wide and then go all the way back to zero right that would be fun so there's there's many different ways that you can kind of interpret this um, but you can also just throw a stop error. All right, perfect. So that's question number eight. There were a lot of questions. I do agree. I almost spent an hour on this and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, yeah, we might want to drop one or two, so. All right, so question number nine, create a function that calculates the factorial. So five factorial is five times four times three times one of a given number. The function signature should look like this. Here x is the function parameter that represents holds the input by the user. All right, so more or less the same as that we had before. So let me copy paste this in. So first I'm gonna say hashtag nine and then hashtag nine. So this is the example code, right? So let's compute a factorial. So we can do this in two ways. So we can use the, the more or less default way which I like um, or we could be really smart and start using recursion I told you guys about Ada Lovelace and, and Charles Babbage and that she's the inventor of recursion and recursion is very very powerful um, so I'm gonna do this one twice I'm gonna once just use a for loop and I'm going to once use recursion so first let's use the for loop, right? So again, I'm just going to have something which will store the result, um, like the while sum or the for sum, and I'm just going to say um, res, right? So my result is going to be one and not zero. And why is it going to be one? Because I cannot multiply a number by zero because anything multiplied by zero will be zero. Right, so if, if I say res times one, it needs to be one, right? So if I would put res to zero, then it wouldn't work because then zero times one would be zero and it will continue to be zero. So I'm just going to say my result is going to be one because no matter what I do, I'm multiplying numbers. These numbers are going to be higher than zero because I cannot take the factorial of zero. Well, in theory you could, but like zero is not in the list of a factorial. So I'm just going to say res equals one. So I'm going to say four um, i in one to x, right? Because x is the user, is the number that the user gives me. And then i is going to be my current number. Or I can call it cn for current number, right? Let's call it cn. So what do I want? So I want to say res is res multiplied by current number and then I'm going to return res in the end all right so let's check this um, so let's take a couple of easy examples my factorial one is going to be one two is going to be two and three should be six right and then four should be six times four it's already going to be hard, 12, 24. So let's see if we get the answers that we expect, right, when we go to R. All right, so basic factorial function, version number one. So that seems to be correct, right? So one times one is one, 
1 times 2 is 2, 3 times 2 times 1 is 3 times 2 is 6, 4 times 3 is 12 times 2 is 24, and so on. So this seems to work. So this is an iterative version, right? We are using an iterator, so we're going to go through the numbers one by one. And of course, I can, I can take a larger number as well. I can take like 900 and then we'll say this is infinite, right? Because it very quickly explodes to being a very, very big number. Um, so I think like 100 is still possible, but then you already see that it's a number times 10 to the power of 157, which is like insanely big. Um, so let's use recursion because I love recursion and I just want to show you guys how nice it is, right? So recursion is going to be the same, right? So hashtag uh, recur, re, recursive uh, factorial, right? Because it's very close to the mathematical definition. And that's what I like about recursion. So again, we have a function of x. Right, so now I'm going to do slightly something different because I'm going to say if x is is 1, I know what's going to be the answer, right? Because if x is 1, then I return the value 1. Because factorial of 1 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1, so that's what I want to do. And then I can say, okay, so if x is 1, return 1. And now I'm in my else branch, right? Because I directly return. So if, if, if I get here at line 125, it means that x is different from 1. It should be higher than 1 because that's one of these things in, in recursion. So we have to make sure that, 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 we, that we check that as well. But, so if x is not 1, what do I want to return? Well, I want to return x times the factorial of x minus 1. Because that's how it's defined, right? Because like 5 factorial is actually 5 times 4 factorial. And 4 factorial is actually 4 times 3 factorial. And 3 factorial is actually 3 times 2 factorial. Right, so and, and this is a really, really elegant solution because it, it looks really elegant, right? It's two lines of code. You have a base case and then you have a, a, a very basically calling the exact same function. Oh, my factorial, sorry. My factorial. So we call the same function, but now with the parameter, but one less. And of course, if I take any number, then doing minus one will, of course, always go and hit one, the base case. All right, so let's try this as well, right? So make this new function, and then we're just going to call it four times with different values to see if it really works and really does what we expect it to do. All right, so recursive, ver uh, recursive factorial, um, and then we see it works really well, right? And the nice thing is, it is actually much more efficient this way, memory-wise. Um, so calculating um, like my factorial 100 will of course give you the exact same answer but it will give it it will give you this answer with less computation in a way because it's much more efficient because it doesn't have to have a for loop or an internal number or whatever no it just says well I'm calling myself again this time with uh, an, uh, with the number one one smaller of course this is really hard to realize so recursive functions are very close to the mathematical definition of the function itself, um, but you have to you, you have to kind of work for getting them, and they don't come easy. So it's it's not it's not wrong to write it like this. In Python, recursion is very slow. Is this different in R? Fact, recursion should actually uh, uh, be much much faster. Um, even in Python. Um, so if there's something that's slowing it down, um, then it's either because you're running out of memory, um, but a recursive call should always be faster than a for loop. Um, and if that's not the case, then the, there's something wrong in the programming language because that, that should never be the case. Um, why don't simply use the factorial function itself? 
we could it's kind of cheating but um, of course this would be a perfectly valid answer as well right so you could say uh, my factorial x what do we want to do we want to return um, factorial x right but like just when using it for Fibonacci um, it shouldn't be shouldn't be um, then there's something wrong there, there there's definitely something wrong because recursion because you're using stack memory and not um, not RAM memory um, it should be much quicker um, but it like I know this from using things like C and C++. I don't know exactly how it is in Python because Python and R are both interpreted languages. So they have some additional overhead and it could be that it's not being optimized by the interpreter um, because of the some overhead. Um, but I know that for example, when you're using C or C++, um, it, it, it works. And yes, you can use the factorial function as well, but then you don't learn anything, right? Because that, well, it's not wrong. It's just not the answer that we're looking for because we want to do the stuff ourselves and not use the factorial function that someone else wrote. Good. Um, had, do we have another question or do we have a break time now? Oh, we have some additional assignments. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So do we want to do the additional assignments? Because generally I don't do them. Uh, because they are additional, they are for you guys. Um, that's also why you have the little piece of text saying that your candle fades as you walk into darkness. Suddenly you realize you are on your own. Right? The idea is, is that these things are just additional for you guys to practice. Um, and I think that the answers are on Moodle. Um, and yes, they are. So they, they are on Moodle. But uh, if, if you want, we can do them now. If not, then we'll switch to the first break um, and then we continue with the lecture afterwards because um, I don't think that, that they're that important. It's something that you guys can uh, um, work on, right? And especially extra two is really, really good. I love the extra two because it's something that uh, was always asked in elementary school to kind of figure out how much math skills children had. Um, so it's a very common test for, uh, for how smart a child is. All right, so if there's no opinions one way or the other, there's no one screaming, please do the additional assignments as well, then I think we're just going to take a break and um, I will be back after the break and in the meantime, we're going to have animated GIFs, of course, like we have every week. I just forgot which animal I chose. I really don't know anymore. I, I did it this morning and then I had a meeting, so I completely forgot which animal I chose. I think it's going to be goats. Something inside of me yells goats. So again, one of these very, very tasty animals. Um, and I will see you guys in around seven to 10 minutes. Uh, and in the meantime, take some coffee, take a little break, and then we will just do um, the lecture. So like I told you guys, lecture will be relatively short probably because it's only like 40 something slides. So unless you guys have a lot of questions, which of course is perfectly fine. Um, poor people cows. Yes, yes, poor people cows. That's, uh, that's a kind of running joke in our department. Uh, we have one colleague who works on goats and she always calls goats the poor people cow. And we also have people working on, on cows in our group. And I always want them to say that cows are the rich people goat, but they don't do that. They, they never do that. I should convince Paula to do that, to, to do a presentation about cows and say, cows are the rich people goat. So. Anyway, um, running joke in the department, so let's uh, let's do the break. Um, so let me switch on the sound for you guys. Then we go to music. Um, then we start our music. Let's do reactor. Ooh, that's a very short one, but that's good. So, and then we go to the break. So I will see you guys in five to ten minutes. So enjoy the break. Um, I think it's goats. So enjoy the goats.
short break, very short break. Five minutes, guys. Uh, that was a rush. Meet me by my sheep. <laughs> well, well, well. Sheep are cool as well. I don't think I have sheeps. Uh, let me actually check my uh, my streaming folder and then my break gifts. Do I have sheeps? No, I don't have sheeps. So that's a good animal to put on the list for a future one. All right. Um, let's do the lecture. Right. If there's no additional questions to the assignments, then um, I hope everyone was able to get through it. Um, there is a lot. Um, I agree. It's a lot, but it's something that you have to practice, right? Because practice makes perfect, especially in programming. You can't learn programming without having a laptop, having an empty Notepad++ window or an empty editor and just starting to type. Good. So. What are we going to do today? Um, so on Moodle, you will find some free books and um, definitely download them. Um, even if you're not going to use them now, you're going to need them in the future. Um, and they were free due to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, um, but I don't know if they're still free. Um, but if they are, then people who are not signed into Moodle can get them from the following links. And of course, I will put the presentation on my website. So there's a link down in the description where you can find uh, links to the, the PowerPoints and to the uh, assignments. And then you can also find a link to the books by clicking on them. I think they're also clickable in the, in the PDF version. Good, so for today we are going to read data. Everything today is going to be about data. So how are we going to read things like tables, text files, binary files, and massive amount of uh, massive text files, right? So for example, DNA sequencing data is a, a big text file with nothing but like 75 to 150 base pair reads in them and millions and millions and millions of them. Which one is the best book? Um, that depends a little bit on your level. Um, if you are a really, really novice, then the first one is the best one. Um, but if you if you know statistics and you know a little bit of R, um, then the middle one is the best one. If you don't know statistics, but you know a little bit of R, then the last one is the best one. <laughs> but they're all three pretty good. And they're all three like relatively relevant. So for today, reading data, um, compressed files, because that's one of the advantages of R is that you can directly load in data, which is compressed using, for example, a zip file or using a tar.gz compression, which means that you don't have to have massive files on your hard drive uh, uncompressed, but you can also compress files and then directly use them in R. Um, and then I want to say a little bit, because once you have your data in R, what are you going to do with it? So I want to introduce three or two new functions, three new functions more or less. Um, so the which function, the in function and the subset function uh, to kind of manage your data and make subsets. Uh, we already saw a couple of these. Um, or yeah, we, I think we saw the which function already, which turns a logical vector into an index vector. Um, but I want to tell a little bit more about them because they are relatively, they, they, they really fit to the, to the topic. And then of course, when we're reading data, we also want to write out data. So the second part of the lecture will probably be about managing your data and saving your data. Um, and I put in a couple of slides about Biomart um, because Biomart is one of these packages in R, which is really useful for people that study biology. And since we are at a biology department, um, I think Biomart is something that people will enjoy because it really helps you to um, to get data from the ensemble database, which is more or less the de facto standard database for biological and bioinformatics research. Um, so I do think that it makes sense to, to also talk about how to get data from Biomart. All right, so a quick recap of the lectures that we already had. So in lecture one, we used R as a calculator. We discussed the different types of data um, and how to index them. And we also discussed things like creating a sequence, repeating something and going from one to 20. And then in lecture two, we talked about variables and control structures and functions and brackets and how to escape stuff. Um, and 
randomness, so drawing random numbers and setting your seed. And I had a few words about clean and reusable code. And fortunately, um, the assignments that I got from the students, because some people um, mailed me their um, answers because they got stuck somewhere, they already start looking a lot cleaner. Like, um, so that's, that's really good. So people are listening and saying, yes, no, we should definitely code like a professional and not just throw everything in R and then copy paste it out of R. So hemp, like clean and reusable code, write it in a text editor, make sure you use proper indentation and these kinds of things. So that's, that's kind of important because it will help you. Nicely structured code is easy to read, easy to understand and allows you to reason about your own code. So in R and data, there's many different sources from which we can get data. So random numbers, we already discussed that, right? And random numbers are a source of data and are really useful if you want to just have a little bit of an example data set and have not collected your own data yet. One other source of data is R packages. Many, many R packages come with example data and some of them actually come with very valuable data sets. So there is a lot of data available in R. So I want to show you guys how you can use that data, which is freely available. And then of course there are files on your hard drive or on a USB stick or wherever you store your files. And these files are also an input source of data. And hey, these can be comma separated files, but also Microsoft Excel files or tab separated files and even images, right? Images are also nothing more than a certain representation of data. So all of these things we will go through um, and I will show you some examples on how you can use R to interpret this data and load it in and do things with it. And furthermore, of course, you can get data online. So for example, you can scrape web pages um, or you can download data from FTP servers and you can do this directly in R. So you don't have to go to the website, click on the FTP site and download the file that you want. R can kind of do that for you, um, which has as an added advantage that, for example, if you are interested in, for example, modeling stock prices or um, modeling Bitcoin or whatever, had things that change very frequently on a daily basis, then of course it doesn't make sense to download a data set which has the current prices. Uh, no, you can directly go to, for example, Google Financial and download all of the financial data which is up to date. And that is a really useful feature because that means that if you run the same script tomorrow, it will have the latest and up to date numbers without you having to go to the website and clicking on it and downloading it again. All right, so random numbers, very nice source of data. Um, so we discussed this in lecture two. So there's a uniform distribution, a Gaussian distribution and a Poisson distribution. Um, and here we see a nice Dilbert cartoon um, about random number generators, um, just like we had the XKCD last time. So random numbers, good source of data, very good if you have not collected your own data, but just want to get some input data, which has a st structure similar to the data that you're going to work with. I told you guys that data is also available in R packages. Um, so a lot of R packages that are out there, they contain example data and you can load them with the data function. And the nice thing is, is that if you, if you just start up R and throw in this command, then it will show you all of the data sets. And that is really useful because there's literally like hundreds and hundreds of free data sets in R that you can use um, and that have been collected by other people. So normally what I do is I load in a data set using the data, right? So for example, the US arrest data, which is data on the United States of the America, um, where they um, collected murder statistics, assault statistics, and then the urban population and also statistics on rape. So it's just some, some historical data, um, which you can use to kind of figure out if there's a correlation between the amount of murders and the amount of rape in certain states in the US. But loading it just is data and then the name of the data set. And if you want to see like the top five or top 10 lines to get an idea of which columns are in there, you can use the head function. So the head function shows you the first five to 10 lines of a certain data set. 
head function, really useful. There's also a tail function if you want to see like the bottom five rows, um, which sometimes is really useful when you load in a data set and you want to see if it really loaded in the whole thing. But the head function is useful. First five lines and it will try to fit it on the on the R window um, so that it doesn't start looping around and these kinds of nonsense, right? Because if you would just type US arrest, it would print all 51 states to your R console and you have to scroll up to see the, the, the column names and, and the first row names. All right, so reading from files is relatively easy, especially when there are structured files. So if you have a structured tabulated file like a, a, a CSV, like a comma separated file or a tab separated file, you can use the read table and the read CSV function. So as a personal preference, I always use the read CSV function because there are some issues with the read table function and it sometimes stops halfway through um, and that's really hard to detect. And the read CSV function just is, seems to be a lot quicker in loading in data. Um, and they do the same thing. And they have the same parameters as well. So if you have a choice, um, I would advise you to use the read.csv function. Right, so it loads in tabular data using a certain separator and you can interpret missing values using the na.strings. So for example, if you get data sets from other people, other collaborators, Often different people use different values for missing values. Sometimes they use nothing, sometimes it's a dot, sometimes it's an X, sometimes they use a minus sign, some people use three minus signs for missing data. So there are a lot of different ways that people encode missing values. And you can set all of these using na.strings. So this is just one of the parameters in the read table and in the read CSV function, which allows you to say these values should be interpreted as missing. Um, of course, you, it supports headers and row names. So you can specify if there is a header by saying, for example, header is true. So if there are, if the first line of the file is not data, uh, more or less the, the, the column names, um, then header is true will treat the first line of the file as the column names. And row names is a bit, little bit special because row names you can just specify the number. So by specifying row names is one, you, you're saying that the, the names that I want to use as the rows for my matrix or the table that I'm reading in are in the first column. You can also say row names is two, then it will use the second column as the row names. Um, and very often these functions don't return a matrix, but they return a data frame. And this is of course because data that you load in, um, in general, different columns have different types. And as we remember from lecture number one, a matrix is something which in which all columns have the same type, like a numeric matrix or a character matrix, while a data frame allows every column to have its own data type. So the read table and the read CSV functions, they try to give you back a matrix, but very often they just give you back a data frame because they cannot figure out exactly um, which type is in which column or which column needs to be which type. So if you look at the documentation of the read table function, you see that it has many, 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 many parameters that you can fill in. And I don't want to discuss all of them. Um, and you, you do need to know all of them if you want to load in all of your data exactly properly. Um, but the main ones are these ones. So it's the header, the separator, the quote, the row names, the column names, the na.strings, the call classes, the check names, and the strings as factor. Good, so let's go through all of these, right? So when we're reading data, I already told you guys the header defines if we have column names. So this is a value which can be true or false. We then have the quote character. So very often CSV or tab separated files, they use a certain quote character. Um, NA is not, av no, NA is missing. So indeed not available, but in, in R we call this a missing value, which is different than an NAN, which is not a number. Um, so yeah, NA is not available, but more or less missing um, because that's how R interprets it. All right, so the quote character is very often used when people save top separated files. For example, if you save a top separated file from Excel, what it will do, it will take every 
entry in the column, right? And then put a quote around it. So sometimes this is like a, a double air quote, sometimes it's a single air quote, and it can there can be different quote characters. Um, so if there is a quote character used in the file, you can tell R that stuff is quoted, so don't read in the quotes, right? Because you don't want the quotes to be part of the data because they're there to signify the beginning and the end of an entry in the file. Then you have a func or then you have a parameter called strings as factors. And this is a very dangerous setting because it, it tells R that if you encounter a character column, turn it into a factor. And the default in R is true. And in my opinion, the default should be false because factors have a very specific meaning, right? A factor is a, uh, a statistical thing, right? It is um, male, female, right? Or it is... Um, um, young, medium, or old. Head, like they are groups. And generally the data that you load in are not factors. And by setting strings as factor to true, every character column that it encounters, it will, it will make a factor out of it. And it does this to save memory, but it leads to issues when you start doing statistics and you assume that this, this is a character vector right so um, but the default value is true so be aware um, that if you read in your data in R like um, your character data from a matrix using the read table it might automatically transform it to factors so generally when I'm loading in files I always set this to false because I am the programmer so I will decide when character data is going to be turned into factors not only am I going to decide, I also always want to decide myself what the base case is, right? Do I want to compare females to males or do I want to compare males to females? And by saying strings as factors is true, R makes this decision for you because the first thing that it sees in this column will be the base case. And that might not be the real base case that you want. And this is especially interesting when you start talking about DNA data, right? Where you have like a reference genome and you have an alternative allele, right? Because you always want to be, have the reference genome or the reference allele to be the base case. And you want to report, for example, the effect size relative to this base case. So in this case, strings as factor, the default is true. In my opinion, the default should be false, but just be aware um, that Sometimes R tries to be smart, tries to save memory, um, but in the meantime, it kind of gobbles up your data um, and transforms it to factors while you actually want to have it as characters. All right, so the separator is the uh, separator character used in the file. So R tries to be smart when you use the read table function and, and takes the character that occurs the most as being the separator, but this might not always be the best choice. So you, you can set the separator to be, for example, comma, or you can set the separator to be tab, or you can set the separator to be space. Row names we also discussed. So row names can be a single number, which tells R the column of the table that contains the row names, but you can also give a vector. So if you give row names a vector, then this vector that you supply will be used as the row names. So for example, if you have a, a matrix stored on the hard drive and this matrix does not have row names, you can supply your own row names while you are loading in the table. And you can do that as a vector. Column names, um, a vector giving the column names. So of course, when you provide column names, the header is set to false. Right? So you can say header is true. If header is true, then it will treat the first row in the file as the column names. If you set header to false, then you can give your own column names um, the way, same way as that you give the row names. So just give it a vector and these, this vector will be used. Then we have the check names function. And the check names function is there because in R, when you're loading in a matrix, R assumes that every column name is a proper variable name. That means that a column name in R is actually not allowed to start with a number, right? Because for example, if you have a column called uh, 10 days, 
So one zero days, then one zero days is not a proper variable name in R. And we will get back to this, why this check names exist. And this is because of the which function or uh, with the with function. Um, and that, that takes a matrix and then every column is turned into a variable automatically. Um, and that's why there's this check names function. Um, so if you load in your data and your header, so your column names of the matrix are being um, changed by R, then this is because of the check names function. So it recognizes that some names are not proper variable names in R and then it will put an X in front of it or it will put a V in front of it or it will change dots by underscores. So a really annoying um, parameter, but it is there because R assumes that column names can be turned into variables just like it assumes that row names are always unique and they should be always unique. So that's the reason why we have these check names. And then we have the skip function. So very often when you download data from a source, it starts off with some header information, right? So this data was collected by Denny. Um, Denny did this and this and this. And then hey, there's all kinds of information about the data that's going to follow. And of course, you need to skip this, right? Because when you're loading in a table, then R assumes that the first row that it's reading in is the, is the, are the column names. And if there's then stuff on top, then you can skip that by saying skip is five, then it will ignore the first five lines of the file. And then the sixth line of the file will be the column names and the seventh line of the file will contain the data that we are going to load in. Call classes. This one is really, really important. So call classes define what class we expect in the different columns, right? So imagine that we have a data set in Excel that looks like this, or and it's, I show it in Excel because that's just nice or aligned, but hey, imagine that this would be a text file. Then we can, then we need to specify for each column how we want to interpret it. Right, so in this case, let's go through it together, right? So and the first one is called ensemble gene ID. So this of course is going to be the row names, right? And row names are generally characters and because this is a character value. And it starts with ENS, uh, M, uh, ENS, MUS, G. Um, and so these are character values which we can load in and can manipulate afterwards if we wanted to yeah, but in this case we have to tell R that these are characters then the next column here is chromosome right and chromosomes are biological objects so they are kind of a grouping factor so they are kind of factorials so they are real factorials right so in this case if I would load it in and I would set this column to be loaded in as factor then it will look how many unique elements do I find in this column and then each unique element will be recoded relative to the first element, right? So that means that chromosome three in this case, in this file will be the default case. And every effect that it will give you when you do statistics will be chromosome X relative to chromosome three or chromosome 16 relative to chromosome three. So in this case, chromosomes and because people normally think about chromosomes as numerical values, that is not entirely true because they are kind of grouping factors. And of course, we also have non-numerical chromosome names like chromosome X or chromosome Z or chromosome Y or chromosome uh, W. Those are all valid chromosome names. So chromosome names generally are factors. Start and end positions are, of course, numerical values. The strand is again a factor, right? Because you can on, only be on the forward strand or on the reverse strand of DNA. Um, we have the MGI ID, which is a character. The MGI symbol, also a character. And we have the MGI description, which is also character, right? So in this case, we would specify call classes is character for the first column, factor for the second column, numeric for the third column, and so on. So we explicitly tell R how to interpret each of the columns of the matrix. And this is annoying to do, but it is important because it, uh, it, it saves you a lot of headache by R interpreting your end positions as being characters, right? And then all of a sudden you want to do mathematics, right? You want to uh, calculate the middle, right? So start plus N divided by two. 
And if you don't put both columns to be numeric, then R might be trying to be smart and say, well, no, this is a character. And then all of a sudden you can't calculate means anymore because you can't calculate the mean when one of the values is a character. So reading in data is very often a trial and error process. So the way that I do it is I open up my file in a text editor to see the content and then it takes me multiple tries to load in the data correctly, right? And I often use the, the head function to look at my data or I do something like this, right? So I, I try reading the table saying separator is comma, this file is what I want to read, store it in mData and then show me the first 10 lines. The dim function is there to ask for the dimensions and always ask for the dimensions and check that the number of lines in the file is the same as the number of lines that are read in. Because it sometimes happens that it quits halfway through because of a special character being in your file or something else which R doesn't understand and when it doesn't understand it just stops reading and you only get half of the data set loaded and that is, that is a very big problem. And so just it takes multiple tries to do these kinds of things generally um, and it, it, it's just a process that you have to go through every time that you get a new data set. And one of the things is figuring out which are the missing values or what people use as being missing values. All right, so when we talk about files, just unstructured text files, for example, when you download the Bible in TXT format, um, and then, then you can use the read lines function to just load in the text file. So it loads in text files on a line by line basis. So it's very suitable for, for example, files which are TXT or C, uh, C, CSV or FASTA files or VCF files. So you can use it to load in any type of file uh, when there is no matrix structure in there. So have, for example, if I just want to read the first 10 lines of a file, I can say read lines of my text.txt n equals 10. If I want to read in everything until the end, I can say read lines, the file name that I want to read in, and then I'm going to say n is minus one. And then that means read everything to the end. So when you give this function a string as the first parameter, it will interpret this as a file name. So it will open the file, read the number of lines that you want and then it will close it afterwards right because normally in programming languages you have to open up a file read from it and then close it but this is done inside of the read lines function when you give it a string parameter so when you give it a character as the first argument so you can of course use r to read a text file line by line because often you want to go through a file, do something with a line, and then move on to the next line. And you don't want to remember what you did with the next line. And so this is very useful when you want to process one line at a time. For example, um, FASTA files where you have a description, then the, uh, the code or the, the DNA code, then again a description, more DNA sequences, more description, more DNA sequences, right? And these files can be huge, gigabytes at a time. So if you just say read lines, my big FASTA file, comma n equals minus one, it will load in data for like 15 minutes and then it will stop and say, I am out of memory, right? So to prevent this, big amount of data are often stored in a row wise fashion. Things like sequencing read or the sequences of genes or uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, they are all stored in massive, massive lists which contain <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of entries. So read lines can be used. Uh, question, how to check data size outside R if you want to know whether R somehow chops off some data? So um, in many operating systems, you can just ask how many lines there are in a file um, by um, the function WC, so word count. Um, and of course, you can open up your file in a text editor and just look in the text editor how much many lines there are. Of course, this sometimes is not possible because many text editors also try to load in the whole file, which is a little bit silly because you only have to load in what you show to the user. Um, so to check the data size, to what you need to do is you need to, sh you need to make sure 
the amount of columns that R reads in is the same as the amount of columns in your in your text file. And furthermore, you need to make sure that the amount of lines it reads in, so the amount of rows, is the same as the amount of lines in your text file. Um, so you can use in, in Linux, you can use something like WC minus L and then your file name dot txt. And then this will tell you uh, how many lines there are in the file. And this, this also works for very, very big files. And I think it's the same in Windows. I think Windows also has a WC um, word count. And in this case, word count minus L means don't count words, but count lines, and then the name of the file. So, and in R, you can actually read in big files line by line um, to make sure that you don't run out of memory. So hey, in, in, in the end, you might have a, a gigabyte file on your hard drive and you want to just process every line one by one because every line is a sequencing read that you for example want to align to a genome. So how can you do that? Um, so hey, we can do that by using something called a connection. So this is relatively advanced. Again, I'm giving you this code now. It's lecture number three, but I'm giving you this code now because you are going to need it in the future. In the current assignments, you're not going to need to do connections because the files that we are going to load in are relatively small. Um, but of course, imagine that some of these files can be like gigabytes big. So connections, when you make a connection, you have to tell R how you're going to use the connection. Are you going to read from a connection? Are you going to write to a connection? Are you going to append? So append to the bottom of the file. Um, R plus means opens a file for reading, but allow me to write and append to it as well. Write plus, a W plus means open a file for writing, but allow me to read and append to it as well. And A plus means open a file for appending, but also allow me to read and write to it. And of course, this, these three are equivalent to each other because it allows you to do anything with a file. It's just that R will optimize reading, writing, or appending for you. So of course, if you open up a connection to a file in read plus mode, and then the only thing that you're going to do is writing to it, then you should have used W plus because that would have been much faster. So it's just an optimization to specify read plus, write plus, or append plus. It's just a hint to R so that R knows this is the thing that the guy is wanting to do with the file. So if you want to read through a big text file, right? So we're just going to read. The first thing that I'm going to say is I want to track the line number that I'm currently on. So line.n is one is means that I'm, we're starting at the first line. Then I'm opening up my connection and opening up a connection is done by using the file command. So the file command takes the name of the file that you want to open and then the second parameter is how you want to open it, right? So here I'm saying open this file in read only mode and then it gives you back an, uh, uh, it gives you back a connection object. So this connection object we saw in T file, you can give it any variable name that you want. Um, but in this case, we call it T file for text file. And then there's this magic incantation. So while the length of the line is read lines, t file n is one greater than zero, right? So what this does, it calls the read line function on the connection, reading a single line, storing this in line. So in the variable line, so this will create a variable called line holding a single line from the text file. And then what are we going to do? We're going to ask if the length of this line is greater than zero. Because if the length of this line is greater than zero, then we have read a line of the file. The only time that the length of the line will be zero is when we are at the end of the file. So this will just read a line into the line variable and check if we're not at the end of the file. What we're going to do is we're just going to cut this line to the screen and then we're going to do line n is line n plus one. So what this does, it just prints the whole file to the screen. And in the meantime, it keeps track of how many lines it read in. So line is line plus one. And of course, because we're now using connections, after we're done with reading from the file, we have to close the file. And this is very important. 
because otherwise R will issue a warning saying that you forgot to close your file. This is not bad. It's not bad to forget to close your file, but remember that there is only a limited amount of files that can be opened at a single time in R. So if you open up like 1025 files, then R will all of a sudden give you an error saying that I cannot open this file because I'm out of file descriptors. I'm out of file connections more or less. So this is just reading through a file line by line. Um, there will be an example, but just copy paste the code and edit what you want to do, right? Because here you now have access to the line so you can do anything that you want. And for example, you can split the line or you can you can interpret the line in a certain way or you can like take the first 20 characters and forget about the rest right but that's something that you can do within the while loop and this magic incantation just means read a single line put it in the line variable and then check if we're not at the end of the file if so do this and otherwise close the file good so i told you that r can also read archive data we can directly use a tar.gz file, so this is a tar.gzip file, or we can use a zip file itself as a connection. So it allows us to read directly from the archive, so we don't have to go into um, Explorer, right-click, extract here, and use a lot of disk space. And this is really useful because it saves a lot of disk space. If you have a very big text file and you want to use it then in R, just first zip it because it will save you like almost probably like 80% of your disk space. So how do we do this? Well, reading a GZ file is the same as reading a text file, but now we have to use the GZ file. So if we have a file which is gzipped, um, which is a very uh, which is a, a compression format, then we can just make a new connection saying gz file, name of the file, open it for reading call it t file we have the same magic incantation just going through every line one by one and then we close it at the end so exactly the same as before the only thing that is different is instead of using file we now use gz file we can do the same thing with the web so if we want to go to for example google.com and we want to read what the google web server sends back to us um, then we can read directly from websites using the url function so again, URL is a connection. So we say URL to where we want to go. In this case, we cannot specify read, write, or append because you can only read from an URL. Um, and then we can just say read lines, my URL, n is one. This will read the first line. In this case, you can also use n is minus one, and that will read all of the text on the website and then put it in line or in your variable. Of course, here it is very important to close the URL. And also here you have to be careful to not get yourself banned from Google or from Yahoo or from Facebook. Read the terms of service of the web server that you are trying to connect to and make sure that it is allowed to automatically, with the program, connect to their web server. The people at Facebook are not going to be happy if you are going to make thousands of connections to their website and it will result in a ban. So read the terms of service for the website that you are connecting to in case you want to read from a website because it's not considered hacking but it's considered very bad practice to use a for loop to read like 5,000 Facebook profiles at once. Even if the profiles are public you're not allowed to do that and they will ban you. They will ban your IP address and they won't let you back in. So don't do this. Actually, don't connect to google.com directly. They actually have an API for that. So you have to connect to HTTPS api.google.com uh, if you want to do that. So don't execute this. Well, you can execute the code like once or twice. They won't ban you for like one or two connections. But if you start making hundreds of connections, Google will be mad at you and they will not allow you to search for at least a week on their web server. So if you have your data in Excel, then you're kind of screwed because Excel is a very, very bad program to store data unless it's financial data because like Excel likes to eat your data and eating up like real biological data or 
or data that you collected during an experiment is bad um, but apparently when you are working in the financial sector then no one really cares about that um, the big problem with excel files is that there is no native support for reading excel files in r and this is because the excel format is copy or is copyrighted by microsoft so you are not allowed to have an open source program like r which has an excel reader and writer um, we have 90% of our data stored in Excel. Yeah, don't do that. Excel is really, really bad. Um, what do I do? Save it as text files or put it in a database um, because there are many, many nature publications where they claim that a gene called October 19th is the causal gene for their phenotype. And there is actually a gene called OCT9 or OCT19 and that's the gene name. But as soon as Excel sees OCT19, it directly changes it to the 19th of October because it interprets it as a date or, and that, that's just bad. And there's many gene names which look like dates, right? So there's also a gene I think called uh, John2. It's common practice in social political sciences, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, because like, if you wanna lie with your data, you put it in Excel, right? And in theory, social and political sciences are not the most hard sciences that there are. Um, but yeah, no, Excel files are a, they're not bad. It's just very, very annoying in biology because there's a lot of gene names which look like dates and Excel will automatically eat them. And there's like, there's, there's YouTube videos and there's like even scientific papers written about why you should not use Excel for scientific data. Um, but for some data, it's perfectly fine, right? I, I use Excel to, um, to register who registered for the course because there it doesn't really matter. Like none of your names are interpretable as dates and there's like, it can't really do anything weird with like um, your student ID or with your Gmail account or these kinds of things. Um, so let's say I get an Excel data set. How do I transform it before entering it into R? Well, you don't have to because there are packages available. There are two libraries available for R that you can use to directly load your Excel file into R. But generally when I get an Excel file, um, the first thing that I do, um, and I don't have that open at the moment, yeah, so generally, let me add a window capture. Oh, let me make sure that I actually close uh, your guys' um, email addresses so that that's not being transmitted on stream. Um, so let me add a, a bit of input capture, which is a window capture. I want to add a window capture for Excel, right? So here we have like an empty Excel file um, and let me make it a little bit smaller so oh that's the wrong window that I'm dragging see never do a live demo so if I take my Excel file right and I make it a little bit smaller so that it doesn't like hit my face or anything um, so let's open up an Excel file for example one that one of my colleagues made oh, that actually was on a external drive that's not connected anymore so I don't want to show you guys the ah, something like this Right, so here we have a file which contains um, data in Excel, which it actually don't save like this. And I, yeah, so here we have a file which contains data, right? So generally the first thing that I do when I get a file like this, I click on a value. I do control A, I do control C, then I open Notepad++ very quickly like this. Then I open up a new file, I disable my um, window capture, I go to my file and I press Ctrl V. And then I just save it as mydata.txt. Problem solved. Data out of Excel. Excel can't eat my data at this point anymore. It can't be smart. It can't do anything. It's now saved in text files. I do have to check that it didn't change any of the gene names, right? Like I have to really make sure that, um, for example, my oct, um, 
well in this case there's no oct11 gene um, but yeah um, if there would be a gene name which would be interpretable as a uh, uh, yeah, not now. There's no gene name here, but it will like if you would put in a gene name, and I don't know if I can actually force this. Um, let me see if I go to the Excel file again. All right, and now I'm going to say uh, file new, right? And I'm just going to type in. Ah, if I do new, it actually switches it to a new workbook. Yeah. All right, now it's starting to crash. I'm trying to do too many smart things at the same time, All right? But now if I would if I would just have a list of gene names. So I'm just going to copy some gene names out of the file that we just saw, right? And I'm going to put them in Excel, right? And now I'm going to add my gene called oct9 and I'm going to press enter. You see what it does? I typed oct9 and now all of a sudden it ate my data. And it would be the same as if I would type January 6, right? Jan says, which would be a perfect gene name. There might be a gene called GAN6. If I press enter, it will... And people have published in nature about 9 minus oct. And that's not a gene that exists. And in Excel, you can fix that, right? You can say right click, then format cells, format the cells, force it to be a text cell, and then press OK. And now what you see, it actually now ate my data again. Because now the data that I typed in to this was OCT9. But all of a sudden Excel says, no, OCT9 is 44843. So it transforms it to a timestamp. And you don't want that. You don't want that saving your file changes your data. So long-term data storage should not happen in Excel. Excel tries to be smart, it tries to help you, but 99% of the time it just puts you over the table and just screws you over. And it shouldn't do that. So don't use Excel for long-term data storage. Use a text file like this, and if it's big, very, very big, zip it. Make it a zip file. Good. So just as an example that like why Excel is really dangerous and there are many publications out there which are very good publications where at some point in the process they used Excel and Excel ate up their file names and Excel is, is famous for eating up your, your data. If you do want to read files directly into R you can use Excel, uh, the two packages XLS or OpenXLS. So both of these packages are slow and relatively unreliable. Like I say, I always export Excel files as CSV. So just open them up, Ctrl A, Ctrl C, go to a text editor, paste it in. If you really want to, you can use these packages to, to, to read directly data from Excel. I guess you can simply set in Excel not to convert the data. Yeah, that would work for me. But then when I send the Excel file to someone else who does not do that and then sends it back to me, how am I supposed to know that at line 10,000, it all of a sudden ate up a gene name? So it, it, like, you can do everything right, but still someone else can screw you over. You can open up the file on your home computer where you just forgot to do it. You can get a new computer from the media Markt, open up your file, and all of a sudden your data changed. And that should never happen. Science is about reproducible research. So, so please, please stay far away from Excel. It, it, it won't screw you over directly, but it will. And you don't want to have your name on a publication where you claim that um, this gene 446189 um, is the gene that is called, and then everyone says like, you're a jackass. The gene's called OCT9. It's not called 44683 or something. Anyway, you can use the read.xls function, for example, from the XLS library um, to read in an Excel file. Of course, you then have to specify which sheet you want to load in um, because, of course, read XLS gives you back a matrix. Um, and this way you can, you can read. 
There's also a write XLS file. So if you really want to live dangerously, you can from R directly try and write an Excel file, which then when you open it up in Excel, definitely Excel will start eating data again, because that's just what Excel does. And that's why Excel is perfect for financial data, because all of a sudden having a date like Oct9 being transformed in 40,000 just means that you're rich, right? That <laughs> it, it, it's just the way it is. Anyway, um, let's do a quick break and then we're gonna do Obama and we're gonna read binary files um, so we're going to use uh, R to load in BMP files and show BMP files as a plot and extract BMP files as a matrix um, so that we can manipulate the different color components and that we can do some fun stuff with R. Um, so this is very advanced. You're not going to use it. It's just for having fun. And that's what we're here about because we're here to learn how to program, but we're also here to kind of learn that programming is... Um, is fun and creative and that you can have Obama morph into a flappy bird for example or that you can have Obama mor morph into Trump and then back and, and just by taking images and doing manipulation and just doing fun stuff with it. Um, so binary files are next. I'm going to take a short break. Goats were number one which means that the next one is going to be and now I have to think really, really hard. I don't know. I, I have no idea what the next break is going to be. I really need some coffee. So I will see you guys in around 10 minutes. Um, and enjoy the animated GIFs. Enjoy the music. And then um, I will be back in like 10 minutes. With, I hope, a little bit of coffee. So that I can focus a little bit more. Alright, so thank you guys still for being here. And um, yeah, we'll... We'll be back in like 10 minutes and then we will continue with fun stuff, um, reading binary files and working with BMP images in R. So let me start some music. I'm going to do barn music. And then we're going to switch to the second break. So see you guys on the flip side.
Alright, made it back in time. Uh, this one was a little bit longer, so I hope everyone had a good break and got at least a little bit of coffee, a little bit of sugar. Um, so, last part of the lecture. So, um, like I told you guys, binary files, um, there's a lot of different binary files, right? Like you have executable files and DLLs, and but for the example, we're just going to use a basic little BMP file. Um, so it's to show you guys what's possible. And you're not going to use it a lot, but sometimes you just want to, and it's just fun. Um, so you can use the read bin function. So read bin loads binary files like images, and hey, you can, for example, say read bin my BMP n equals one, and then it will load the first byte of the BMP file. If you want to read the whole file, you need to get the size of the file. So you can get the size of the file by using the file.info function. So you give this file.info function the name of the file that you want to load in, and then from that you select the size. The file info also contains like when was it last modified, when was it created, um, but in this case we want to have the size, and then we can just say n equals and then this size of the file, and it will load in the whole thing. So you have to tell R how you want to load in the binary file. So this has to do with the R type system. So there are many different types in R, um, many more than we already discussed during the first two lectures. And uh, the read bin has a parameter called what, and this controls how the file is loaded. So you can say what is numeric, double, integer, int, logical, complex, character, and raw. Um, and in many cases, we just are going to use the raw function because all of the other ones interpret your binary data in a certain way. Um, and we don't want that, right? We don't want R to act like Excel and do conversions for us. No, we just want to know the raw bytes that are in the file. So about BMP images, so BMP images are a two-dimensional array of pixels, right? So here we, for example, see a little image. This image has 12 pixels. Um, the first one is greenish, the sixth one is blue, right? And this is a two-dimensional array because this BMP image is an image which is six pixels by two pixels. So it's six pixels wide, two pixels high. Of course, on your hard drive, this file is a linear sequence of bytes. So it, it's not a two-dimensional sequence or anything magical, it's just nothing more than start of the file and then all of the bytes that follow it, right? So every BMP file that exists comes with a header and this header is 54 bytes long. And this tells you the name, or not so much the name of the file, but it tells the operating system that this is a BMP file and it tells it the dimensions of the file. And then the BMP file continues. So after that, for each pixel, we get three different bytes. So the first byte is how blue the pixel is. The second one is how green it is. And the third one is how red it is. So instead of using an RGB color scheme, BMP images use a BGR color scheme. So this is more or less how it looks on the hard drive. So the first 54 bytes are the header of the file. And after that, we have the color code of the first pixel. So at position 55, 56, and 57. At 55, we find the blue component of the first pixel. 57, we find the red component of the first pixel, and so on. All right, so that's how BMP files are stored on your hard drive. And this is more or less how they are interpreted. So how you should view them. So <clears throat> for example, during the assignments, we will be loading in a image. And so this is called, uh, so we, we just take the name of the file and we store the name of the file into image.file, just so that I can reuse the name and the name is pretty long and the, the, the variable name is shorter, right? So I, first going to ask for the file info so that I can get the size and I'm going to store that in my image.info. And then the next step is to read in the whole file. So I'm going to say read binary image file. So the name of the file and then n is um, the size of the file. And I'm going to give that as a numerical value. So those are, that is the amount of bytes that I want to load in. And then what, so how am I going to load it in? I'm going to say, give me the raw bytes. So give me the raw numbers in the file. If I then store this in something called myimage.data and I just type 
iImage.data and let it run all the way down the screen in R, um, then you can see that this looks like this, right? So at position 97451, we have E4, which is a hexadecimal code, um, which means that they, instead of counting from 1 to 10, um, the computer generally internally counts zeros and ones, um, which are then summarized into hexadecimals where you count on a 16 base system. Doesn't matter too much, um, but we, we will get back to that, how that works. But and so the data is nothing more than just a big vector. Every position in the vector contains a number um, stored as a hexadecimal value. So this is the image that we're going to use during the assignments. It's a 200 by 200 byte, uh, 200 pixel by 200 pixel image of Obama. Um, so hey, the first thing that we need to do before we can do anything with this image is of course to remove the header because the BMP header does not contain any data on colors or on pixels. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to take myimage.data since it is a vector, we're going to select from the vector everything. So what are we going to do? We're going to just say minus C1254. So throw away the first 54 entries in the vector, right? And then I'm going to store this as my image.color data. So what happens is I have a vector from one to all the way to the end, and I'm just going to say throw away the first 54 bytes. So now the first byte so the blue component of the first pixel is stored at entry number one. Entry number two is the green component of the first pixel. Entry number three is the red component of the first pixel, right? So it's just removing part of this vector. So after we've done that, we are, for example, interested in selecting one of the color components out of the figure. So, for example, if we want to generate this figure in R, um, then, for example, we can say, well, I I'm interested in the blue component, right? So every everything which is blue or the amount of blue at each pixel I want to extract. So how can I do this? Well, we already saw this. It's relatively easy, right? So we're going to say create a sequence from one to the length of the my image color data. So from, from one to the end of the image. And I'm just going to step by three, right? So now I'm going to create a sequence which contains one, four, seven, ten, um, thirteen, and so on. Right, so I'm just going to point, um, make an index vector, which just takes every time the blue component of all of the pixels. So then I'm going to take my image.color data, use the sequence that I just generated, right? So selecting the pixels or the, the blue component for each of the pixels. I am then going to say as numeric. So instead of using the um, hexadecimal values, convert them to numerical values and then put them in a matrix, which is 200 by 200 pixels, which is the original image. And then I'm going to store this in a variable called blue because it's the blue color component. And now if I want to recreate this image in R, the only thing that I have to do is just say image. So I'm just going to use the image function give it the matrix that I just created, and then it will create a matrix which looks like this. So here you can see that there had the red color here on the side of Obama actually has no real blue elements in there. That's why it's yellow. Yellow means that it's very low. You can see that the, the blue elements are colored in red, and red is of course the it is, is, is intense, right? So the, the color scale that I'm using here is from kind of white-ish all the way to red, red being the highest, white being the lowest. So you can see that there's almost no blue in this area, there's no or not a lot of blue in this area, and you can see that there's a lot of blue here, but also in the blue jacket. So that's how you use the, the image function in R to more or less get, get images into R, select the color component that you want. We can also do this, for example, for the red color component, which would mean that we create a sequence from, th from three to the length of the image, stepping by three. Same system. Good. So this was normally the break. Um, so hey, we've seen several functions to load the data into R, so we can use the data function to 
get data from our packages, we can use read table, read CSV. We can use the read lines function to read in text files, either wholly in one go or to read it line by line. And we can use the read bin function to read binary files. But of course, then the question becomes, what do we do with the data after, right? We can, we can color and we can do something like this where we just extract one of the components. But generally when we load in data from a matrix, then we then want to do manipulations on it. So how do we do these manipulations? So one of the things that I use a lot in R is the in function. And it allows you to filter. It allows you to ask questions, which elements of A are also in B, right? So imagine that I have two matrices loaded into R. One is called A and the other one is called B. Both matrices have a column called ID. Then I can match these two together. So I can ask A, take the ID column in B ID column. So which ones in A are also in B? Right? And then I can make a subset of A saying that only show me or make a make a smaller matrix where I take A and now only take A and B. So only take the rows of the A matrix, which also which have an ID, which is also located in B. I can do it the other way around, of course, as well. I can ask which elements of B are in A and then subset B using this vector that I just created. So the in function just gives you back a true false vector. So for every row in A, for every entry in A, it will tell you if this entry in A is also found in B. And this is very efficient. You can do this on millions and millions of entries and it will run in a very, very reasonable amount of time. So it's much better than using this, than using a for loop and then taking the first entry of A, checking all the entries of B and then setting it to true. So which we already saw, it transforms a logical vector into a numeric one. So it tells you the indexes which are true, right? So it, it does more or less the same. It doesn't do the same thing as the in function. So the in function gives you back this true false vector, but you generally compare it with which to get the rows of the matrix in A, which are also in B. Yeah, so if I have a vector which is true, false, true, true, false, um, then if I ask which on this vector, it will tell me one, three and four are true. So uh, generally what you can do is you can say which A and B, these are the indexes that I want and then A indexes will do the same thing as just using A and B directly. It's just more clear that you are using the indexes when you use which. So the which function is really useful because it transforms a logical vector into a numeric vector and it shows you which elements were true in the original vector. So you can also make subsets in this way, right? So you can subset a matrix or a vector by logical vectors. And for example, if you want to take all columns containing a value higher than six, right? So imagine that you have a big numeric matrix and you're interested in which columns have a value which is higher than six. Then you can say, well, I first make a selection vector myself. I call this selection initially this is all false, right? So for every column in A, I'm just going to say false, 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 because initially I don't know which of the columns is higher than six or contains a value higher than six. Right, then I'm going to just do a very basic for loop saying for X in one to the number of columns of A, I'm going to check if any of the values in this column is higher than six. If this is the case, then I'm going to select my, uh, I'm going to put my selection at this point to true. So when this is done running, now I have my selection vector and then I can say from matrix A, only take the columns which were true, or I can use the which selection to select them by index. Doing the exact same thing, it's just that the which function is a little bit clearer. Um, so you can do it like this, right? So just a little example on how you can use um, head the, how you can build your own logical vectors to allow you to select from your matrix and make a make a sub matrix. So of course you don't have to go through the columns. You can also go through the rows and then ask questions about the rows. But generally you want to keep columns. And so this is very useful if you want to remove columns which have missing values, or if you have a column and you say, well keep all of the columns where there's less than 10% missing data. 
these kinds of questions. So you can do this with a very basic for loop. Again, we use a very common idiom in R where we first make an empty vector or a vector which contains only false and then we select the corresponding elements by setting them to true after which we can use the selection vector to make a subset of a bigger matrix. You can also use the subset function. So the subset function is there to create subsets of matrices and data frames. I don't use it a lot, but I know a lot of people that do. Um, so for example, here we have the air quality data set. The air quality data set is one of these famous data sets in R, which a lot of tutorials use. It has four columns. The first column is called temperature. Second column is called day. The third column is called ozone. And the third, uh, fourth column is called wind. So it's just from a certain month they've measured the temperature the ozone concentration and the wind speed um, and these are the different columns of this air quality data frame so we can also say data air quality to load it and then we can say subset air quality select the entries where the temperature is above 80 degrees fahrenheit and i want to select only the columns ozone and temperature you can also use it to subset and then say well say give me all of the columns uh, give me all of the rows where the days is equal to one and select everything but minus 10 so throw away the temperature column so only, so give me the column day ozone and wind right so it, it allows you to also do a negative so an inverse selection by saying don't give me this column and then it will give you all the other ones uh, you don't have to uh, have a a selection parameter right if you just want to select two uh, columns or select multiple columns you can also leave the middle part out so you don't have to have a selection for a certain value in a certain column so you can just say subset air quality data set select is ozone through wind and now it will take all of the columns starting with the ozone column ending at the wind column so but then you have to specify select Good, so those are some ways of getting big data sets into R and making a little bit of subsets. So we will practice this during the assignment, so I, I wanted to show you the in and the which. So if we want to, so we now can load our data from a file, we can manipulate it, right? We can make a subset and then we want to, of course, write it out. So for writing out data into a text file or to, into a comma separated file, there is the write table. So if you have your matrix or you have your data frame and you want to save it to a file, you can use write table. It again has a lot of options. The options I always use is these. So write table, give it the file name, separator is set to true, row names is false, quote is false. Because this allows me to take the, the table which was written, do control A, or, uh, no, it allows me to just take the file and drag it into Excel. And it will directly load the file in a proper way. Of course, it will start eating up some of my data because if there's OC9 as a G name in one of the columns, it will transform it. Um, but a lot of times the people that I work with don't really work with text files. So they do want to see their data in Excel. So then you have to make files and this is just the easiest way to do it because I can just open up an empty Excel document, just take the file, drag it into Excel and Excel will understand the structure of the file and will load it in properly. So don't use row names, don't use quoting, set the separator to tab and then just write a certain matrix into your file. So but there's multiple ways of saving data, right? So one of the things that we already saw was using the cut function, right? So the cut function is there to either save data into a log file, but I also use the cut function a lot when I have this going through all of the columns in a big matrix or going through all of the rows. So I often have like a little progress report in R saying that I have done one out of a hundred two out of a hundred so that I can estimate how long the whole computation is going to take right because sometimes you write code that code runs a long time and then you want to know can I sit here behind my computer and wait until it finishes or is it just time to go home and come back tomorrow so I always use the following system so I write a for loop where I say for x in one to each of the columns of the data I do my computation code here 
And then at the end of the for loop, I have this one line saying cut done x slash n call big data slash new line. Right. So every time that it finishes processing one column, it will cut this to the screen. Of course, I can add comma file is append is true and then it will write it to a file. I also use this a lot for like log files, right? So here you have a progress report. You can write these progress reports to a log file saying append is true, um, file is log.txt, right? So you just say cut message, store it through this file and append it to the bottom of the file. If I want to empty the log file, then I can say cut nothing. So an empty string into this file and this will clear the whole file. And this is also really useful when you want to build, for example, a computation, which you can continue later on. Right, so you make an empty result file and then you just start computing. Every time that you have one row of computation done, you save it to a file. And then if the power goes out or your computer crashes or a tornado happens and it destroys your computer, well, of course, then it's really hard to continue unless you're saving to an, uh, a, a cloud storage or something. But hey, in theory, you can use this as well to continue computations later on. So hey, the cut function is really versatile. You can print to the screen, you can print to files and hey, by saying append is true, um, it will just add to the file um, just the lines that are already there. So how do you do a continued analysis? So you store computations as you go. Right, so here we have a little example. So for example, I have, I first do an empty file, right? So I, I have a temp file, which I empty. So I only do this once. So, or, 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 in, or, or when I want to reset the computation, then I generate a big data matrix. So in this case, I have 10,000 rows, a thousand columns, right? So some big data. I load in an empty result matrix called TMP. And this is a matrix containing NAs, no rows, no columns. And then if this temp file exists, I'm going to read it from the hard drive because I'm going to save in temp.txt, I'm going to save every row after I did my computation, right? So if the file exists, then I'm just going to load from this file. If the file doesn't exist, then it, it shouldn't load from the file because I didn't do anything yet. Right, so I'm going to say if the file exists, read this file using the separator and then put it in the temp variable. So how does this work now? So now we have either loaded the file or not. And then we can say for x in the maximum of 1 to the n row of temp plus 1, right? So continue from where we left off. So if I've already got a thousand rows in my file, I know I now need to continue at row a thousand and one. So n rows of 10 plus one, or one when, when one is higher than this, because the number of rows of 10 can also be zero, right? There cannot be an, uh, it, the file could be empty. So I'm just putting my starting point to where we left off, and I'm going to continue until the number of rows of big data. Then here I have my analysis code, which might run for like half an hour for each of the rows. And then every time that I have my result, I'm going to write the result to this temp.txt file, right? So I'm just going to say paste X to the result because X is the row that I'm currently looking at. Take my results, separate them by tab, and then I put a new line at the end, write this to the file and append it at the bottom of the file. And of course, then I also print my progress saying that I'm done with row number X, right? So this will just one by one fill up the file. And then if something happens, like the power goes out at line a thousand, then I can start again later on by starting at a, a, a row, uh, at starting at line a thousand and one. Good. The last section is Biomart. So if I need my data in R, Right, I can manually search and create an Excel file, which is a lot of manual slave labor and is very, very error prone because Excel can read up, uh, can mess up my data and I can make a copy paste error. Um, so that's generally not the way that you want to collect large amounts of data. Another way to download your data in most cases, if you think about biological databases or big databases with financial data, they also provide a bulk download. So they have an FTP site. 
Of course, there's less chance of errors then. But the problem is if I'm reading data, for example, from Google Financial and I'm reading data from uh, Yahoo Financial or Microsoft Financial, then all of these data sets, these bulk data sets have different formats. So I need to harmonize the formats before I can do anything with this data. So and, and this holds the same for a lot of biological databases. So if I have data and I want to get data from most biological databases, I can use Biomart. And Biomart is the preferred way to retrieve data directly into R. So if I'm interested in, for example, a certain gene in, say, elegans, or I'm interested in a certain gene in Drosophila or mouse or humans, I can directly download all of the data that is known about this gene from Biomart in a structured way without having to go to the website, look it up, or uh, go to the FTP site and download all of the genes in the mouse genome. So Biomart is a community-driven project, and it it does so. It's it's driven by the biological community, so it's paid for by different universities, and it promotes unified access to distributed research data to facilitate the scientific discovery project and it connects most if not all biological relevant databases. So that means that things like CAG, Ensemble, uh, UCSC, um, the big uh, DBSNP, uh, which contains variation data, all of these databases, they have a Biomart API. So they have a Biomart plugin, which can be queried by Biomart, and you can get data back in a certain structure, and you can define what kind of structure you want. There's also different APIs, so you can use it from R, but also from Perl and Python. Uh, you can even use it from SOAP and REST and XML, if you wanted to. But we're just going to show you some examples in R, but be aware that also if you want to have, or if you program in Python or if you program in Perl, um, you can also use Biomart to directly download data from biological databases. So there are three things that you have to know about Biomart. So Biomart functions by having something which is called a mart. So a mart is a link to a database, for example, the SNP database in mouse or the gene database in humans or the variation database in, in Drosophila, right? So there's different marts that you can choose from. If you just want to see them, see what's available, you can type list marts. Of course, you have to install the Biomart package first, um, and I'm going to show you that later. But by listing the marts, you can get an overview of which databases you can connect to and which data sets are available. If you want to then query things, we, we need to know what we can ask of the database, right? So these are called attributes. Attributes are things that we can retrieve from the database. So if I want to, if I connect it to a different, uh, to a Mart, right? So if I made a connection, then afterwards I can use my Mart to list all of the attributes. So these are things that I can query. So for example, gene names, gene identifiers, start location, stop location, chromosome, uh, orthology. Do you also have other suggestions like Biomart but for social and political sciences? That is a question that I have to take some time but there there probably is something like that um, but I don't know if it would be that if it would be that common in a way um, because in biology there's this big concept that genes are shared between different individuals and I don't know if there's something that big in, in social and political sciences right because Biomart is literally a project where like hundreds of universities are involved to make sure that everything can connect together and can talk to each other uh, but I will google around so there might be APIs for social and political sciences to download for example voting results across whole of Europe I could bet or I would imagine that within the European Union, um, the different elections in the different countries of the Union will all have an API which allows you to, to query data. Um, but Biomart is very, very optimized for biological data because, of course, there's like 20,000 genes in a human genome and all of these 20,000 genes are also in mouse but on different positions in the genome. And they are different lengths and different variants are available. Um, but I will Google and I will get to I, I will get back to you about that question because there probably is something in that 
matter for biological or for political sciences as well. So we have a MART, which is a database connection. We have attributes, which are things that we can retrieve. And then we have to tell the database what we are going to query by, right? Because I can send the database a list of names of genes, but I can also send the database a list of locations. I can also send the database a list of um, descriptions, and then it will use the description to find the corresponding gene. Right, so I need to tell the database what my value means. And what my value means is called a filter. So there are, so there are three things that I need to specify. Which database do I want to connect to? What do I want to retrieve? And what do the values that I am providing you mean? So how do we query that? So as a little example, we first have to install the package. So the, the problem with the Biomart package is that it's not available on CRAN. So it's not available on the standard R repository. It is in Biomart. Uh, it, it's, in, uh, uh, it's in Bioconductor. So Bioconductor is a, a, a package repository for R aimed at bioinformatics. So I can just connect to them by using this magical incantation. So if it's not installed, install it. Um, and if it is installed, then install the Biomart package. So once I've installed Biomart, I can load the functions in Biomart. And here, for example, I can say connect to the SNP database from Ensemble and connect to the mouse SNPs. So to, to variants in the mouse genome, right? So this is called my Mart. So snip they bay, and I say use Mart, use this Mart, use this data set from this, from this database, and then this is my database connection. And then I can do the query, right? So I can say get from Biomart. These are the attributes that I want to retrieve. I want to retrieve the reference SNP ID. I want to retrieve the allele. So if it's an AC SNP or a, a GT variant or a TC variant, and then I want to know which chromosome it is located on and what is the start position, which is also the end position because SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there are uh, positions in the DNA where there's in the population, some individuals have a G and other individuals have a T, for example. And then the filter that I'm going to use is SNP filter. So SNP filter just means I'm going to specify SNPs by their official SNP ID. Um, and then here I'm going to provide the value. So this is what I'm going to query for. So this is the ID of a SNP that I might be interested in. And then of course I have to specify which MART I want to use. So in this case, query it from the SNP database. Good, so that's a very, very short introduction to Biomart. Um, there's a lot of different databases. You can list them all. You can list all of the attributes. Generally, these databases have thousands of attributes and they have hundreds of different filters that you can use to kind of get the data that you want. Um, but for today, I think this is all. So there is one question about Biomart, um, which of course, if you're doing political sciences or social sciences is not that useful, um, but it's just to show you how to use an API. And, and like I said, many different fields have different APIs. I bet that there is an API for election results um, within the European Union yeah, so that you can compare like voting behavior in France with Austria and these kinds of things. Good, so we actually made very, very good time. So it's four, four, seven. So it's like a quarter to five. So even by doing all of the assignments with you guys, just one by one, just me typing them in and explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, we, we went really well. So we still have 13 people watching, which is really good, which means that we only lost like one third of the people that signed up for the course. Um, which is not too bad. Um, I know that the beginning is hard and it's something that I can't really change, right? Programming is, is hard. You have to spend the time to get familiar with it. Could you explain again what an API is? Okay, so an API is called an application programming interface. So an application programming interface is a more or less special website, um, which is not 
supposed to be visited by humans. It's supposed to be visited by computers. So you have, for example, the Google API. So the Google API allows me to, use, to write a program which queries data from, for example, YouTube, like your comments that you are doing on the stream. Right? And using this API, the computer can retrieve this data into a computer readable format and then, for example, save it to my hard drive or display it on my, on my window here. Right? I, I'm using OBS, so I can use overlays to overlay information on, on the window if I wanted to. So an API is something that, that is very broadly defined as, an, as a website, an endpoint, where you provide specific queries and these queries result in data being collected from the database, which is then presented in a way that a computer can, can read. So generally APIs provide you with uh, JSON data. Um, let me see if I can find an example because there is uh, API example Google Financial, which I used a lot in the past, but I don't know if it's still online. Oh, it actually got offline. Uh, mm. Let me see if there's a nice example of an API. Ah, for example, the, uh, the uh, weather data. Um, so a lot of weather forecast and weather um, companies, they have, um, um, yeah, they, they, they have an API which provides data on weather. So, hey, you provide the location, then they provide computer readable, like a very short description of it's sunny, this many degrees, this is the temperature. Um, YouTube has an API which you can use to embed videos in your website using JavaScript. Yeah, so it's just a way of connecting something which is available online automatically without a human having to go to a website. Um, and there's, there's many different APIs out there. Google Maps as well. So it has an API which you can use to load a map with custom markers. So you just provide the markers and you provide where you want to look at. So yeah, there's many different, many different APIs. So. All right, and this is going to remove. Very good, very good, very good. All right, so does that explain your question, Leonardo? Or do you want to have a real, real API example? Um, because I could, I could make an example for you next week because I, I hadn't prepared an API example. It just stands for Application Programming Interface, which means that you can write an application which automatically queries data from a database that you don't control. Perfect. All right, so there's no further questions. Um, would be cool. Okay, okay, then I will look for an API on political sciences, and then we're going to do an example on that if I find one, um, political and social sciences. Um, let me write that down so that I don't forget, that I don't forget, that's not the one that I wanted to use. I want to use, uh, uh, I can't reach my piece of paper. All right, there we are again, so API example. And if I don't find one, then I will just use a Google Maps um, example because I did use the Google Maps API on my website. All right, if that's everything, then guys, thank you for being here so much. Um, I'm still discussing to get a room um, so we can do the assignments in person. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what's going on with the Verwaltung and why they are ignoring my emails and uh, <laughs> it's it's weird but uh, the big issue is is that I, I had to submit all of the paperwork for the course in like November of last year and then we didn't have the option to do it in person so I never got assigned a room and now apparently everyone already got a room except for us and we're at the back of the queue um, so and 
since in theory we are going to be as many as 35 people, we need a big room as well, which is a little bit of a difficulty because I think most of the big rooms are taken. Um, but I, w I would really love to be able to see you guys in person and um, help you guys directly by watching over you while you program and being able to directly help you and like touch your keyboard when necessary. So, all right. Um, if there's no further questions, no further remarks, then thank you guys for being here so much. Um, I actually make a a finish screen but I think it will mute all of my microphone and audio when I go to the finish screen so I first want to thank you guys so much for being here and um, thank you for all the questions the more questions we have the more fun it is um, and I hope to see you guys all next week I hope in person and I hope that I get a response before the end of the week um, so that I can mail you guys, but it might be that I mail you next week on Wednesday evening saying that we can do it in person. Um, if that would be the case, then that would be the case. If I, if you don't hear anything, then assume that it's going to be online, um, but I do hope that we can go and uh, have a good time in person. So see you guys next week. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for liking the stream and all of that things. And then, uh, yeah. See you on the flip side. All right. Bye-bye.